Having a narrative, the story we tell about ourselves institutions is absolutely key. How did it come that we developed a world in which we would do a lot of research, come up with great insights and findings and so on, give them freely to the private sector, and then buy them back? But well, one of the things that's come out of the Great Recession in the U.S. is the American worker is so much more productive. Let me tell you how that happens on the faculty. Three years ago, we had four people retire all at once. For senior people in my program area, we hired two. Two people are now doing the job of four people. That's how come we're looking so good. We have this um, thing called track transparency accounting exercise. I can't remember exactly what the acronym stands for, but every few months, every term, I think it is, we get asked to account for how we've spent every fraction of our time. And it's, it's just a complete nightmare. But one of the, the features of this accounting online system is that you cannot put down that you've worked more than 37 hours per week. I mean, everyone's working more than 37 hours per week, but it won't let you do that. If, if you do that, it just it won't let you submit the form, and then it can tell you that if you don't want to enter hours, you can put it down as percentages. So it's not, it's not by chance. It's absolutely built into the system. Facing escalating climate-related justice issues of access to food and water, displacement, war, species extinction, and possible human extinction from the planet within just a few generations, isn't our collective apathy startling? We sit here in a province where just a few weeks ago, much of the population in the north, largely indigenous, was displaced due to forest fires linked to climate change. As others have written about, despite the centrality of land and environmental politics for neoliberal capitalism, there's so little broader engagement of these dimensions by critical scholars of neoliberalism. This apathy is in part a measure perhaps of our implicitness in Eurocentric, colonial, neoliberal, and so on, relationships of economy to land as property, as resource, as leisure, as backdrop. It is also, it seems, a measure of our inability to keep up emotionally or conceptually with the conditions we are surrounded by. Few were alarmed by the disposability of a substantial majority of students of color. Progressives and conservatives explained the leakage differently. Progressives talked about structural racism and capitalism. Um, conservatives blamed the kids or their moms or inadequate intelligence. But they both agreed that it was inevitable that only a small group would graduate. Little did I know, footnote Yvonne, the limits of ethnography. Little did I know in the late 1980s that mass incarceration was being drip fed into the darkest neighborhoods of New York State. State coffers were quietly realigning budgets, migrating monies and bodies of color from schools to prisons. In 1973, the New York State prison population was 10,000. By 1980, it was 20,000. By 1992, it was 62,000. So as I sat that day in that gymnasium, I didn't realize that the state had other bids on these bodies. In what ways does the, the particular history of indigenous dispossession, mediated through a settler logic of elimination, differently position native scholars vis-a-vis -vis the academy and other marginalized groups? What, what are the incommensurabilities between sovereignty and social justice projects? between those defined by relations of erasure and dispossession and those by exclusion and oppression? And what kinds of solidarities and collectivities can be developed among groups with a shared commitment to working beyond the imperatives of capital? At its core, this analysis turns upon a theorization of the academy as an arm of the settler state, a space where not only capitalist relations and modes of production are reconstituted, but also settler logics. Now, Gros Voguel, Dussel, Quijano, and other decolonial thinkers have argued convincingly that the ego cogito, the I think therefore I am, which underwrites Descartes' concept of modernity, replaced the prior Christian dominant perspective with a secular, godlike, unsituated and monolithic politics of knowledge attributed mainly to white European men. The presumed separation and superiorization of mind over body of this ego cogito 
establishes a knowledge system disassociated from the body's positioning in time and space, and achieves a kind of certitude of knowledge. I think, therefore I am. As if inhabiting a solipsistic universe by means of some kind of internal monologue, isolated from social relations with other human beings. 